morning, and thank you for joining us today for Beyond COVID, Cloud, AI, and the Digital Economy, sponsored by March Capital. I'm Jamie Montgomery. I will make a, some brief introduction of our three guests today, and a little longer introductions will be posted in the uh, chat box on the uh, Zoom call, so you can read more about them. But I, we have some great resources, and we want to get to them uh, uh, quickly. Uh, the current pandemic has accelerated the need for companies to embrace digital transformation. Our discussion today will examine what it means to truly operate end-to-end -end digitally, how technology is now bought, what types of technologies are being urgently deployed, and how the shift has put legacy systems at a disadvantage. There are literally hundreds of billions of dollars of market cap up for grabs, and I believe this could be one of those discussions where 10 years from now you look back and say, boy, I sure wish I'd been paying attention. Well, I'd like to introduce our guest, Hank. Kravilsky is the uh, EY Vice Chair uh, for Transformation, most recently Vice Chair for Americans Advisory, um, where uh, EY has helped grow, improve, um, protect the businesses through innovation and transformation. His 30 years of experience and oversaw more than 20,000 consultants providing digital analytics, cyber tech, and other services, advising C-level execs on leading management techniques and business transformation, breaking down silos and, and, and uh, imbuing a risk culture throughout their organizations. He works closely with the CEO of, of EY Carmine and his new role to partner with leading technology innovators such as ServiceNow, ASAP, and others to bring that, those, their great technologies to the market. Hank, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Jamie. Welcome to be here. Frank Slootman is chairman and CEO of Snowflake. Frank has over 25 years experience as an entrepreneur and executive in the enterprise software industry. I think he's uh, a true company builder and one of the most highly respected executives in the technology industry. I first came across Frank when he was CEO and president of ServiceNow from 2011 to 2017, taking the organization from a $100 million revenue business through an IPO to about $1.4 billion in revenue, but also increasing our market cap from about a billion dollars at the time of the listing to $25 billion during his tenure and put it on its current trajectory to now it's worth 75 million. Prior to that, he served as the CEO of Data Domain, growing a small business into a large business, taking it public and eventually being acquired by EMC for 2.4 billion. Frank is also a mentor to a number of young entrepreneurs, including Gustavo. Uh, Frank, thank you for joining us today as well. Great. Gustavo is the founder and CEO of ASAP, a leading AI native customer interaction platform for Fortune 100 organizations to help contact center agents work better and faster. The solution augments customer service agents, improving their efficiency, increasing customer satisfaction, and driving down costs. So it's a, it's a very compelling uh, proposition. Their customers include Verizon, Vodafone, American Charter, among other leading companies. Full disclosure, ASAP is a March Capital Portfolio company, which just named a Forbes AI 50 list, one of America's most promising artificial or the world's most promising AI companies. This week's Forbes has a three page feature in Gustavo. Since he's in quarantine in Montana, the local store only has the March issue. So uh, he, he, uh, he will share with us the one that's been FedEx to him. But congratulations, Gustavo, and thank you for joining us today. I'd encourage you. all of you on, on, online, we have hundreds of people from around the world to um, utilize the Q&A function in Zoom. Uh, we'll probably go for about 35, 40 minutes and open it up for some audience questions using that function. So. Thank you. Um, Frank, let's start off with you. Um, um, what, so what is the digital economy and kind of what role does data play? And, and tell us a little bit about your, your, what you're doing now. Yeah, maybe we'll, we'll narrow it down a little bit. Um, you know, we, we uh, constantly hear about digital uh, transformation and term gets thrown around, you know, left, right and center. And, uh, you know, everybody has their own idea of what that means. But you know what we've seen over the last uh, you know ten years is that we've seen sort of a progressive uh, disintermediation of business processes where, where people are gradually disappearing, and uh, processes become full on digital. And I'll give you an example like the experience with HR. It used to be you know you called HR, uh, you emailed them, you interacted with people live or over the phone. These days, you know, HR has become you know ninety percent full on digital, right? And uh, that's highly scalable, it's super efficient, and it's uh, it's super economic. And that has spread out to all kinds of other uh, you know workflows. I mean, in the world of IT, of course, we learned that through our uh, our years at ServiceNow has become you know full on digital. 
Um, people are not touching the process anymore. People are supporting the process, right? Um, the cloud obviously uh, has helped enable that hugely um, uh, because of the, the, the connectivity and the scale that it uh, provides. And the, the pandemic that we're uh, living through is, is, is accelerating that massively. People are finding out that it's, uh, you know, it's very difficult to have, have your own data centers when this stuff is going on. Um, the company that I'm with, you know, right now, I mean, we just sort of walked away one day and never missed a beat because we don't have any on-premise capabilities of, of any sort. So that's, that's pretty attractive uh, to live in a, in a completely network-centric uh, uh, in, environment. So digital, um, you see it in, in lots of businesses. Newer businesses are completely digital from the start. You know, you take, uh, you know, they're, they're following the, the path that has been sort of blazed by the likes of Google and Facebook where, you know, revenue gets generated completely programmatically. There's not a single person in the middle <clears throat> of those processes. And of course, you know, newer enterprises are taking a page out of that, out of that book and uh, are really instrumenting and designing themselves from the ground up to be full on digital. And you see it even in financial services, which traditionally have been very high touch uh, businesses, but now, you know, financial institutions are are acquiring uh, data, uh, which they refer to as life events. So for example, you know, somebody uh, is, is leaving their job or someone's getting divorced or, or so on. And then that then triggers all kinds of financial service offerings, uh, you know, to those kind of audiences. And they literally, you know, completely transact and fulfill digitally without a person ever being in the, in the middle. That plays out now all over, uh, all over the economy. So that's sort of a, you know, a little bit of a sample flavor you know, of what digital transformation uh, really means. All right. Well, thanks for that. So let's get some sense for the size of this opportunity. Um, uh, Hank, do you want to lay in on that or Gustavo? I mean, what, I mean, we're, are we talking about com completely redoing the current software stack plus, you know, redoing all the traditional, I mean, there's no such thing as an analog industry anymore. So, you know, when Bill McDermott talks about $7 trillion up for grabs, what, what, what's your reaction, uh, Hank? Yeah, no, I think uh, that, uh, you know, the word digital transformation, we have many firms saying, well, what other transformation is there? Why would I do an analog one? But in, you know, we've really been looking at it and working with our clients on, you know, what are you looking to drive? And, you know, as clients are responding to um, the technology afforded them, you know, they can create whole new customer experiences, whole new employee experiences, and, and doing both of those, they then do fundamentally different supply chains. And, you know, a $7 trillion market opportunity, yes, that's there. And, and, and COVID has only shown us the need for acceleration of speed is even more important. And, and I think the important thing, Jamie, that's really why this is accelerating is, and I call it the exponential technologies. The different technologies are linking to each other to empower more, right? AI has been around, but as cloud computing made it more scalable and quantum computing made it more executable and the data was stored, that's when it catches fire and cybersecurity are, are protecting it. So it's, when you look at the digital transformation and, and the digital economy, it, it's the different technologies linking to each other to create that momentum and scale and you know every new customer experience creates a, another bar for every company to go match that, and, and the same through employee and supply chains. Okay, well that's good. So, Gustavo, why don't we get a little specific here? Contact center agent automation. You know, it's mentioned with you know, 15 million plus agents globally, a 350 billion dollar market. Not glamorous at all, contact centers. But kind of what? Why did you choose this market? And what are you doing that's with AI that's truly unique and differentiated? Sure. Uh, well, I think to follow on, on Hank's comment, digital transformation in some ways has already happened. It's happened in our lives. If you look at our collective dependency on our phones, uh, I would argue that we've developed this uh, pretty significant link with, with that piece of technology that gives us access to information, to connectivity. You can argue that the interface is not as, as efficient as it, it, it could be, but we do have organizations like Apple at the forefront of developing those systems. And, and I think they've done generally a really, really good job. And that's why we've adopted it the way we've adopted it. So we have developed this in the consumer world 
symbiosis between people and machines. In the business world, in the real economy, I think we're lagging behind significantly, primarily because the legacy systems that ran how enterprises work are enormously antiquated, are not being developed by the apples of the world. And that's where the $7 trillion opportunity really exists. And in modernizing, revitalizing, and digitizing the economy. We've selected this problem of how large enterprises interact with their customers, primarily for three reasons. One, economically, is hundreds of billions of dollars. So it's one of the largest problems out there. Number two, it has systemic inefficiency. It's very broken, and it's primarily broken because the technology that has served this problem for the last two, three decades is pretty flawed. And then the third thing was that the data is not only abundant, uh, but it's super interesting from a for, for particular for the type of AI research that we do, which is centered primarily around natural language processing. Um, so what ASAP makes that I think is unique, and in this problem specific, is that the way we've treated this problem is trying to deflect interactions away from humans, trying to automate things before they touch people. But the people are still there and they're there at increasing numbers. In fact, call centers generally grow at between 10 and 15% per year. Attrition rate in those workforces is on average 100%, and ramp up times are between four and six months. So by the time people are proficient at doing their, their job, they're gone. It's a really messed up um, operation world. And what we've done that's different is really centered on people. We're trying to build technology that makes people better, that allows them to do their jobs more effectively, more productively, more efficiently. And I think that's really the, the, the analog that we're trying to draw between how we've become intertwined and, and a symbiote with this thing, with building technology for people who do work that will make them better and that will make those jobs therefore more sustainable. Okay. And specifically, you know, to ASAP, what's, what's unique and differentiated? There's a lot of science projects in the AI world, lots of company's been funded. What, what, what's your special sauce? Yeah, I think it's a combination of two things. One, state-of-the-art machine learning capabilities, and two, a product vision that actually solves the problem. So our product vision, which entails being the platform that contact center agents use to do their job, has a set of capabilities that currently haven't existed, like telling the agent what to say or telling the agent what to do, and then beginning to automate chunks of the workflows of those agents so you can increase their throughput and capacity, not trying to remove the agent. So each one of those features that accomplishes that has an underlying algorithmic capability at which ASAP generally is state of the art, very close to state of the art. So when a customer says something to an organization, the first thing you need to do is understand what that is and classify that utterance. That is a natural language processing task called text classification. Uh, then if you want to suggest to the agent what to respond, there's a separate task called text generation. If then a customer comes two days later after having a long conversation and now has a new agent, you would like to summarize everything that's been said so you can create a snippet that brings up the new agent up to speed much more effectively. That's called text summarization. It's another fundamental research question in, 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 in the community of folks that, that do this type of AI research. And at each one of those different uh, fundamental questions, we have some of the best people in the world who academically publish and are trying to generally advance the field, but also develop this algorithmic capability that we can productize in ways that continually make our product better. Okay, let's, let's talk about generally, Frank, maybe I could ask you to talk about <clears throat> what's new, what's different this time around? You've been very successful 25 years. Um, and you've spoken about speed, talent, and network effect being your key differentiators, speed, talent, and network effect. And you know, what, what's your philosophy in today's world where you, know, you have, as, Frank, as Hank was saying, some of the emerging technologies, uh, you have changing business models, you have rapid uh, uh, technology evolution. Uh, kind of what, what's, what's your management philosophy, strategic philosophy about growing a business and today's environment? You know, I, I often uh, tell uh, younger people uh, when they're looking for career advice that, you know, be very selective and careful about what elevator you step into because some of them go up, some of them don't move. 
Some of them just go to the first floor and others are going down, right? And it doesn't matter how good you are, how hard you work, how smart you are, uh, because that elevator, you know, determines your, uh, the range of opportunity and the range of, of outcomes. So you want to you want to think uh, you know a long time uh, you know about those sort of things. Um, when I first entered you know software, um, it's a long time ago, unfortunately. Um, software was barely an industry because you know software was bundled with uh, you know with hardware. You know, you look thirty years later, um, you know software is pretty much eating the world as as Mark Andreessen uh, has been, has been quoted on. It's become just this mega industry that's only getting bigger and bigger. Uh, obviously, when, when you step into that elevator, you know, good things are going to happen to you almost, you know, regardless. Instead of falling down, you're falling up, right? And uh, th those are really important concepts. So, um, you know, you, you want to move into markets that are rapidly expanding, really understanding mega trends, uh, because they're going to be very forgiving uh, in terms of, of what you do. And when, you know, when the tide's running out, I mean, it gets painful for everything and everybody, right? That's, that's sort of my, my most fundamental concept about, uh, about looking at, at, at businesses of any kind. Okay, and so, um, uh, well, the venture world backs a broad range of companies. We've always been concentrated in our kind of philosophy. We try and bring the, you know, the Charlie Munger view to tech investing where you, you, know, you double down on your best companies. I mean, You've been around the sector for 25 years. You, you had a big success at Data Domain, where I think you only raised like 28 million, and then ServiceNow was profitable. Right, you know, even by the time you joined it, right? I mean, so you've always been very capital efficient. What's what's the secret? It seems like it should be getting even more capital efficient now. What what's what's the secret to kind of and you know scaling companies effectively? I mean, is it is is effective sales organizations? Is it execution? Kind of what you know. What were some of the lessons learned? Yeah. Well, you, you, you want to scale, obviously you need, you need big markets uh, because if, if, if markets are not, you know, allowing that, uh, you know, nothing you do will, will make a difference, but you, you want to focus on the concept of friction. And, uh, you know, we, we've talked in the past about, you know, how Amazon is the king of eliminating friction from any process. And obviously that has led to extraordinary scale in all the businesses that are in. I mean, friction is what you need to be focused on hour to hour, day to day, all the time. And when you're selling, it's all about inspecting, why can't we sell more? Why can't we sell faster? Why can't we ramp people faster, right? So really inspecting and studying, you know, what the sources of friction, of friction are and then beginning to address that. And it's a game of inches. It's not a silver bullet, like, you know, one yeah. thing, something that you're constantly working on. Uh, you, after a while, things go faster and faster and faster and faster uh, because you're eliminating all these rocks in the river, I sometimes refer them to, right? So the river is running, but you're hitting rocks all the time. Once you keep removing the rocks after a while, you're running straight through. And uh, that that's the secret to uh, to scaling large businesses. And I think people in sales yeah. have been here a long yeah. time get that. 100% agree. And I think I, we have to give our hats off to our uh, George Kurtz at CrowdStrike. We're always about reducing friction in sales organization, contracting, uh, uh, you know. Uh, well, um, we'll come back to that in a minute. I think, Hank, you know, you've been around EI for a number of years. And you know, maybe we can talk a little bit about e EY's role in digital transformation and how that's evolved. Because I think, you know, one of the things we've touched on is that the, the business models are evolving, you know, maybe in the past, companies were concerned about scale, efficiency, et cetera. And now it's about speed and the network effect. So I like a little bit about EY's role in digital transformation. And, and yeah, thank you, Jamie. And I think, I think it builds well off, you know, Frank's and Gustavo's comments. And, and, we, and we've been doing a lot of research on, you know, really who has been successful in this period of, of transformation. And, and as you said, you know, the old business models, the old value creation models focused on scale and efficiency and scope in, in many ways created barriers to entry that, you know, uh, variable cloud consumption has fundamentally changed. And when you look at the environment today, those differentiators around technology and um, changing demographics and, and alignment with the environment. And, and we, we found three, you know, really keys to transformation and success. And, and you know, I think this, this hits well to Gustavo's comments on the call center. You, you really got to be human centric like and, and deeply, deeply understanding your customers, um, 
both in a B2B and a B2C sense and, and, and drive to your employees, as I made, I made that earlier, uh, there's this concept of technology at speed, right? And, and you gotta be, and I think that that word speed really means two things. It's um, be able to deliver speed to your customers and move with speed and implement with speed, but also this time to value. And, and I think one thing we've seen in, in the COVID environment and the acceleration is, you know, EY aligning with our technology partners, we've been able to, to fix things or create value for our customers in weeks, which may have taken months before. And, and this need for speed is, is so important. And lastly, um, you know, innovating at scale. Right, we, we talk about innovation a lot uh, and driving the success. You look at, you know, as I move into my new role, a lot of that's driving innovation. But if you're not driving it at scale, you're, you're not moving really the needle. And this is when, you know, particularly when I talk about the legacy companies, um, who have a lot of advantages. If if they don't adopt those three things, you know, they they are really um, their, their, their transformations aren't gonna keep pace with the newer firms. And that's, you know, but if they can nail that, um, you know, that, that really uh, gives them some great advantages. All right, well, let's build on that, Gustavo. Uh, thank you, uh, Hank. Uh, you know, so how does automation change the way your clients, such as an airline or, you know, or pick one, engage with their customers? And, and, and are, are customer expectations changing? And, and you know, are, are you taking legacy customers and putting them into the, you know, leapfrogging them? Well, I think customer expectations have changed for, for quite some time. The large enterprises have been relatively slow in reacting and adapting to those new expectations. And, and in some ways, if you think about how we can make some lemonade out of the, the COVID crisis, one of the ways that I think uh, organizations can really step up to meet those expectations by modernizing how they interact and serve their customers. Um, and I think the, the point that Frank made of reducing friction is one that I think the market by and large has internalized. And most large enterprises are now figuring out how do I remove friction? But one, one uh, consequence of removing friction is that um, it's easier for you as a consumer to change from whoever your um, service providers are or, or, or organizations that serve you. Um, because that friction has been reduced. And one bad experience uh, has a pretty strong uh, correlation to lost business. So I think that this crisis, which by the way, particularly in the, in the customer experience world, uh, was very problematic. It, was, it manifested as one of the biggest uh, operational headaches for, for large enterprises during this COVID uh, pandemic because you had historical volume of interactions inbound uh, we, what we saw across our customer base was generally between 200 to 1,000 percent increase in, in interaction volume. And at the, the same time, you had to send the agents home. So you were operating at 40, 50 percent capacity at best. And that's why all of us, if, if you open your, your bank app, there's probably a banner on top that says we're experiencing massive delays. Please, please don't call us and try to help yourself over here. Um, and that, that problem was ubiquitous across most large companies. So I think that the crisis exposes in some ways who's been swimming naked perhaps, or, 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 or it forces change that is not as important during good times where things are going well and, and the calcification of some of these organizations prevents them from making the big decisions. Uh, but now is really, uh, there, there's a significant necessity for, for transformative innovation. Um, and I think that transformative innovation that meets customer expectations is, is going to be at the top of every CEO's list, not just because of the importance of customer experience, but because of the size of the expenses as well. Like for many, for most B2C organizations, this is one of the top three items in their, uh, in their budgets. So, I mean, we have individual customers that spend three, four, five billion dollars per year on this one problem. And I think embracing the right technology will allow you to reduce that expense um, by half or more in just two, three years. So I, I do see a lot of motivated enterprises that are um, rising up to the challenge. All right. So, um, well, one of the questions really has to be is, um, you know, you're talking about the top two or three challenges. Hank, you know, in your, from EY, what, 
your and your clients, what are, what are the top two or three tech and operating challenges that uh, your clients are facing? You know, kind of post COVID. Is it, you know, is it cyber? Is it is it uh, customer contact? I mean, what, what, yeah, no, I think I think it's a great one, and I'm going to jump on the cyber one, Jamie, because yeah. it's one we we often don't talk as much about. And I think you know, Gustavo referenced the phone, right? And, and as we as we go to make digital connections and, and create, making digital relationships is more and more again B to B B to C. Um, you're opening up an experiences, and in a period of uncertainty, I think that's just in your own lives and in business sense. You tend to go to who do you trust, right? So one thing I'm really we're spending a lot of time talking to our our customers is as you're as you're executing your um, your business agenda. Do you really have a focus on what I'm going to call digital trust, right? And as a as, as organizations are stewards of data, and uh, protecting those organizations from cyber, that that balance between custom experiences and digital trust is is a really really super important um, area. And and just in I would say in the last three months, you know, if you look in, in this period of COVID, um, the the hottest um, competency or domain of focus area has been uh, cyber, you know, and I think in, in, in many ways, the, uh, the distribution of work in, in such a rapid fashion has created some opportunities and exposure points um, for firms to, to move into that. So, you know, certainly that area of digital trust uh, has been a big, big one. And, and I think in general, when you think about COVID, um, a tragic event from, from sickness and, and, and death, but it's it's also, um, when you look at it from a business standpoint, it, it showed the imperative for acceleration. Yeah. And, and everything we've talked about, you know, the firms, um, you know, we've got a lot of firms that have said, well, I'm clearly dealing with the now from a, um, from a health and safety of my, my customers and employees. There's no day about this is an acceleration of the beyond and, and the issues we've been talking about thus far. Okay, Frank, why don't I circle back to you? What, what's changed in, from your, I mean, you have a, you know, we've talked about a couple thousand customers. Uh, and what's changed the most since March, uh, significant? And is it the sales cycle? Is it uh, speed decisions are being made? Is it a uh, sense of urgency? Or, I mean, what, or has anything changed? It's just, just sped up a long-term trend. What, you know, what what, what's been, been super difficult um, is just assessing demand sentiment. In other words, how, how is this really affecting me? Obviously, we, we have some of the glaring examples, uh, you know, in travel and, and, and aviation and, and what have you, where they're going, you know, down 95%. But everybody, you know, is feeling the knock-on effect of demand, and it sort of varies by geography and, and line of business and all this kind of stuff. How do you get a handle on that? Right, I and mean, yeah. people stop giving guidance, of course, because it's like there there is no visibility. So, yeah. how, how do you run a company when you you have no visibility? And the answer is very carefully. Um, yeah. How you sort of progress, and you uh, sort of keep your your foot on the on the throttle and the brake at uh, you know at the same time. This is where data becomes really important, right? This understanding the demand environment is what people are becoming intensely focused on. Uh, instead of just relying on, on anecdotal observations and talking to people and, uh, and, and and so on, this is almost unprecedented. You know, we we uh, you know we normally rely on historical data uh, to give us predictive powers over our, our business, and all of a sudden, you know, the historical data is not terribly useful. You know, um, in terms of making decisions: are we hiring? Are we not hiring? Are we spending? Are we not spending? So we tread very carefully. That's that's the big change. You know. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I mentioned the. Um, Frank, this morning, a number of our leading companies are, are deployed Snowflake, and they you know, couldn't do what they do without it. It's just a, you know, it's a game changer for them in terms of uh, um, you know, providing real-time insights for their customers uh, when they run their AI models over the database. And, and also, the data lake expands uh, across other Snowflake users, so you end up with this you know, potentially great competitive advantage that we, we view, kind of a, the data becomes a moat the insights from the data become a moat around the business. And uh, but I guess my question would be, you know, with this trend, what's, what's been one of the most innovative uses of data that, you know, you've seen that you can talk about? Is there a particular forward leading customer? Is there a government agency that, because everyone's grappling with uncertainty. Is, is, have you seen a, 
you know, you know, a super impressive, you know, set of insights have been garnered that's been enabled by your technology that you can share with us? Well, yeah, data has, you know, I mean, data is used obviously in, in, in every walk of life and every, every conceivable, uh, you know, application, but, you know, where it's completely reinvented, uh, how we do things is obviously on the sales and marketing side, right? Because un understanding relationships uh, with customers, and this is, you know, where, where AI and data scientists come in, is hugely important. I mean, when, when I go, you know, to buy something online, I mean, what do they know about me? You know, they will be buying data on, on the open market uh, about me and then run their models to figure out, you know, what I'm prone to want to buy in addition to that, right? And people like Facebook, you know, and, and, and Google, of course, are extremely good at that. But really uh, filling in the, the digital relationship with customers makes company extremely powerful in terms of, 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 of driving that relation, uh, you know, forward. And then I, I was, I, I had a, a conversation not too long ago with, um, you know, the people who own Gucci and, and all these brands in, in Europe. And um, I think years ago, I bought one of their, their watches. It was actually a very expensive watch and they never ever had a digital uh, connection with me uh, ever. Right. It's like, you know, you have somebody that spends a shit all the money with you and, 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 <laughs> and they never talk to you again. I mean, who does that? Right. Yeah. I mean, the whole idea around data is you use it to completely know your customers and predict, you know, what they are, what they are going to want to do. And actually, this is why companies like Facebook became so huge because their data was extraordinarily predictive in terms of what people would be interested in. Right. So data science, you know, I, I, I keep saying this over and over again, it, it is the discipline and profession of the future. It is, it is enormous, the potential that's going to get unlocked, especially because now we have data platforms that have the scale and the performance that can fully, fully drive it. Um, you know, <clears throat> Frank, uh, I would totally agree with you on that. And I got a note from the uh, Chancellor, University of California, San Diego, said he couldn't join us this morning, but as head of his data science program is listening in. So you may have a bunch of applicants from the, awesome. the, the largest data science program in the Western United States uh, after this. So, you know, right. there you go. Hey, well, so, uh, Gustavo, back to you. What, what are you, um, uh, are you seeing any requirement to change your business model or how you operate in this you know, and, and do you have a point of view on what does a successful company in the post-COVID world look like that's any different than what we did before? I mean, you're up in Montana with your executive team, you know, normally, you, don't, you know, is this your first trip to Montana? Well, it's the first permanent trip to Montana. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, I think like, like Frank said, I mean, we're, we're, also a natively digital company. So while we have a few offices around the country and world, uh, we went to work from home. I think it was March 3rd. We were one of the early ones and we didn't miss a beat. It was pretty smooth. It was pretty seamless. Um, and uh, I do miss people. I, I love seeing people in the office, chatting with them. I think we, we all miss the impromptu ability to tap someone in the shoulder and ask a question or grab a quick coffee. At the same time, I've heard a lot of consistent feedback from members of our team who, who say that they feel in a net basis more productive. There's, there's fewer destructions that they can pack more work into the same number of hours. So um, I think this will change how we work and it'll change it uh, fundamentally and, and probably will change it for, for most organizations. I think the other perspective is uh, the ability of uh, access to talent. Uh, previously, we were pretty constrained by talent that existed and resided within the vicinity of our offices. And that seems foolish now because there's a lot of great talent, just a Zoom call away that is gonna be equally committed and motivated and capable uh, to working uh, for you. So I think this, this, this new reality brings about a, a whole set of great okay. and positive opportunities. Well, we're gonna uh, start taking some questions on the chat, but um as I kind of wrap up some of the ones we had on our script, but um, Frank, uh, you know, we're, we'll make open this up for all three of you. Um, what are some of the big white spaces where you see big companies? And one of the questions was the elevator is going up, you know, where is it going? Yeah. And, uh, you know, what, what, what are some of the areas that come to mind to you that uh, some big IT companies can be built in? Um. 
I'm going to think about that for a minute. Gustavo, you go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Thank you for that, Elvis. Reciprocating kind with the next question. Uh, <laughs> I, I do think that the idea of making people better, which is a central purpose of ASAP, is, is one that will likely expand the borders of, of ASAP as an organization, because I think it is the big transformation opportunity. If you look about, if you think about jobs, uh, if you think about jobs in America, <laughs> over the last two decades, we've lost millions and millions and millions to jobs, uh, millions of jobs uh, to outsourcing. Um, which I'm not going to get into the societal implications of, of exporting jobs, but needless to say, they're, they're not very good. Um, so I think when you can develop technology that makes people more productive and reduces the unit economics of those people so that you can re-onshore those people back to um, our country, that is a yeah. very, very positive trend and one that I think is only trend. doable. Yeah. Um, through technology, because rational choice tells you that if you can get the same level of output for half the cost elsewhere, you're likely going to go there. But if you can get it for the same or more as a result of technology, I think that's going to be a really, really powerful trend that not just ASAP, many organizations are going to be able to build gigantic businesses on the premise of making people better. Okay, so Hank, you know, EY's um, mantra is changing the future of work. And uh, so do you think we're gonna have more jobs or fewer jobs in IT as a result of automation? Or? I, I mean, I think when you look at this, Jamie, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a believer of the, the more jobs and, and different jobs, right? And I think when you look at the, the opportunity for you know, tech business-led technology transformations, um, you know, that's gonna you know, create a lot of uh, needs, right? And, and what, what we're seeing within our workforce and with our clients' workforce, um, you know, the the traditional uh, bifurcation or binomial of a business person and a technology person is getting blended. Uh, in a good sense, uh, people coming out of campuses today are far more digitally native than in the past. Um, but we're, we're, we're investing a lot of um, time and, and, and money and, and building up our talent on the, the, the digital skills our entire workforce needs to, to, to do. And that's across all our things, our, our audit businesses, our tax businesses, our consulting businesses. Um, so I think you're gonna see, you know, growth. The other areas, you know, we're, we're very encouraged that uh, technology job creation can be, a, you know, is, you know, it, it can address some of our, our workforce employment issues. I mean, we're doing a lot of work to, to train people up with technology skills in that area. So, um, uh, you know, I'm a big believer that it's gonna, it's gonna be additive. Um, and, and there's a lot, to your question on white, white spaces, there, there's a lot of markets that still haven't been, been tapped. A lot of, even thinking, you know, the future of work conversation we just had was very dominated by a, a services employee. Uh, okay. I think the future of work for a manufacturing employee in, in, in smart factories and areas is that's a, another huge white space. Yeah. Well, you know, sometimes a great business can be predicated on a fairly simple uh, um, concept or market requirement. And I think, you know, I go back to um, now, uh, which is a partner of EY, um, you know, and Frank, you, you're CEO here, IT help desk automation. It wasn't necessarily a glamorous market, but I remember when you took it public in 2012, I think the street guidance would be a $4 billion company in 2020. And uh, right. you, you, met that, you met that target. Uh, it's now a $75 billion market cap, but can you share with us kind of some comments on how now became such a significant company and um. you know the, the the really important observation for service now was that you know everybody uh, including Gertner group and the likes you know thought of uh, service now as a ticketing company right it's, it's a help desk company uh, it's a small market um, it, it's kind of a boring sleepy market and Gardner once referred to it as this is the last battle and we'll move on uh, what, what they what they failed to sort of see at that time was that you know ServiceNow was a generic uh, task management platform that was applied to the ticketing and 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 help desk business. You know, very similar to the conversation we had about AI, it is a, a generally capable uh, technology, but it needs to be applied to very specific use cases to become productive. So what what we saw at at ServiceNow is a generic platform that we could uh, you know automate workflows across any service domain, 
uh, and, and customers, by the way, showed us the way. I mean, I, I wasn't that smart. I mean, I just watched what customers were, uh, were doing and we, we saw our platform do things that had nothing to do with ticketing. And all of a sudden we understood this is a generic task model. Anything can be defined as a task. Anything can be defined as a unit of work. And then we started to stand up business units and, and hire people very specific to the industries that we were going into. And uh, you know, I remember one year we started up like seven or eight new uh, new business units to, and uh, they, they all fired. In other words, they all, they all, they all ramped in very short periods of time. So basically it became a, a rapidly expanding market and because the generic platform was so capable, you know, we could stand up, you know, whole new products in, in, in a matter of months. So that, that's the story of, uh, of service now that sort of continues to this day, you know? Yeah. Oh, it's been, uh, Paul Barber asked me to ask you that question too. So <laughs> Paul here, he was the former, yeah. here, former chairman. I imagine he was an easier board member than uh, Doug Leone, but we won't have to go. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly easier to play golf with. Doug brings his coach and his trainer with him, uh, uh, working out between shots. Paul's more relaxed. All right. So that's the secret to the venture world, how people play golf. But Frank, your, your, your hobby is sailing. And you've a world-class sailor, Transpac winner. Uh, you know, what, how do you apply your leadership talents to a hobby like sailing? Is, there, you know, you know, is it the same level of intensity and competitiveness? Is it, you know? It, or, it, well, on the, on the one hand, it's, more, remarkably, it's remarkably analogous to, uh, to business because, you know, hey, you need, you know, a really good boat, but then you need a really good crew. Uh, it's a combination of technology and conditions and competition and uh, making decisions. Uh, the, the, the only huge difference is that in sailing, you make split second decisions and you know immediately whether you know, you're up to crit without a paddle or, or, or whether it was a good move or not. So the feedback is, in, is insanely quick. In business, that doesn't happen, which is what makes business difficult, right? I mean, we, we make decisions and we sometimes don't know for a long period of time, you know, whether it was, you know, uh, good or not. So, but, uh, you know, we, we love sailing because it just combines uh, all these different elements of competition, technology, weather conditions, teamwork, uh, all of that uh, in, in one cocktail. And uh, we fight it down the race course and uh, afterwards we have a beer, you know? <laughs> yeah. I love that competitiveness. George at CrowdStrike, you know, races cars and, you know, just, it's, it's, it's something that it's an outlet there. That's, you know, for a team sport too, which is uh, very important. Um, so Frank, Hank, um, you know, you, at EY, you, you look at a broad set of uh, your clients requirements and you know, how, how do you pick partners in, you know, the cyber IT automation supply chain, you know, what, what are the key attributes of a partner and what, and what attracted you to partnering with ASAP? Thank you, Jamie. One of the, um, when we look at partnerships and, and, I, and I said earlier, I think that the time to market with partnerships is even more important uh, now. Um, you know, it, we start with the cultural alignment. And I think, you know, as a, as a purpose-driven organization, you referenced that earlier, building a better working world. You know, it's really important that um, the two firms align in culture, uh, including, you know, part of the culture, the commitment to the employees and the clients. Um, and I think the other thing is, um, you know, really, where is the synergy in, in solving a client's business problem? And I think in a lot of, a lot of relationships between a, a consulting firm and a technology firm, you know, it's that finding that, that sector, sector or functional use case where you could you know, both bring it, bring it in together. Increasingly so, um, you know, we're seeing, you know, trends to what I would call joint product developments. And, and you even see in the last three months where, um, you know, our clients, our mutual clients want to move, move so quickly, um, you know, getting a, a consulting firm with one or several technology driven firms to attack an issue together. Um, I think it's going to create a, you know, I think there's going to be more and more of that in the market. Um, and we've always started with, uh, I, think, I think this is a little bit of, you know, pretty, pretty obvious is um, start with client successes. If, yeah. you, if you can't add value in your first three, four, five um, activities, uh, you know, you're not going to build much from there. So really, um, you know, have some wins in the market and then that, that scale it gets, uh, it gets more scale and opportunity. Yeah. Gustavo, uh, one of the questions being asked, and um, I'm going to ping this, I'm, I'm not going to uh, have your colleague in Montana answer this. This one's for you. Um, 
Talk a little bit about the uh, uh, access to capital, kind of low cost capital for private, uh, for public companies versus private companies. And how did you think about the valuation when you announced the, this recent $175 million Series B? You know, what, what, what were the balancing factors between uh, the investors and the uh, management team? Yeah. First of all, we're an expensive date and, and we think of ourselves this is an expensive date. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Hopefully it'll be self-fulfilling. Uh, I, I, I think that good companies will always find access to capital. I think in the case of ASAP specifically, and, and, I, and I, rec I say this recognizing that for most startup CEOs, probably access to capital occupies a healthy amount of their, of their mind share or a healthy amount of their sleeping time. Uh, when, when they can't sleep because of it. We, we've been very fortunate that from very early on, we've been backed by a, a handful of really wonderful um, uh, venture capitalists like you, like John Dorr, like John Chambers, like Dave Strong, um, and, and a few others. And I think what has attracted those folks to what ASAP is doing is really the long-term vision, the, the idea uh, the high risk idea of doing something great, of building a lasting, enduring, independent company. Um, and I think that in that context, uh, the number of opportunities that exist out there that really are that ambitious uh, are not that many. And, and there's a lot of ingredients that you need in order to be able to execute on such ambition, starting with people. Everything we do is a result of the people we have. And, and just like we've been fortunate with, with the investors that we have, but we've been, I would argue, even more fortunate with the team members that we have and the people that choose to join ASAP and, and pursue its purpose. So um, and I'm sure it's a crappy environment. Uh, there's probably some amount of valuation compression. We didn't suffer much of that, but, but we've been an anomaly in, in most of our funding history. All right, thank you for answering that. So I have a question from um, a, a CEO in one of these, uh, what was, we describe as a legacy industry. And, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about it early on, we probably didn't touch on it enough, how um, the, you know, the potential disadvantages that le legacy industries have compared to uh, digital industries. And uh, I guess the question really is, what are the top uh, two or three things that would help uh, an executive in that industry to accelerate adoption and, and transformation? You want to try that one, Frank? Or? Yeah, you know, I, I have this conversation, uh, you know, all the time because we see people on the entire spectrum from being very advanced to being literally in the stone age. And we sort of have to meet them, you know, where they are and then sort of take them, uh, you know, on the journey. But we, we always, uh, you know, tell people, say, look, time is not your friend. You know, in other words, you know, you can put this off, but it's going to become harder and harder. You got to learn, you know, to evolve and, and flex the muscle of transition and transformation all the time as opposed to becoming you know kind of st uh, stale in your ability to evolve because you can't stand still you, you got all kinds of problems uh, you know for example talent right i mean how do you hire people you know when you have a very uh, antiquated infrastructure right uh, and then pretty soon you can't hire talent now, now you can't evolve anymore at all right so it, it, it you have to move it doesn't mean you have to be at the absolute bleeding edge that you you got to keep a steady pace in terms of the adoption of technology and 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 be very proficient in adopting technology as opposed to well I'm afraid of security I'm afraid of privacy and I'm afraid of this and uh, a, a lot of IT people are are extremely risk and cost oriented right and and that, that sort of breeds that attitude that I don't find particularly healthy I think it's really hard and CEOs by the way they have to really establish a culture of no don't hang back you know lean in right. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's very much a cultural thing that has to come down from the top, you know. Well, so how, how do you know, your current business is, is, has a utility model. Does that, ex, does that reduce friction? Because people can kind of buy and buy kind of like the old you know, Splunk model or other models where, you know, you can customers, uh, CrowdStrike has that. People can go on the Amazon store and download it, try it out, pay with Amazon credits. I mean, is, is that one of the secrets is to kind of reducing friction, a utility model or other models well, of customer acquisition? The, the utility model uh, really democratizes access to technology because you don't have to have this massive layout of capital, uh, enormous staffs to, uh, to run uh, you know, systems uh, and software. 
uh, it's not just a utility model where you know we, we, we pay by the drink, but it's also that we only pay for what we use. Uh, in other words, it's 100% elastic. I, I can stand up a massive amount of infrastructure for a very short period of time and only get invoiced for what I actually consume. So that, that dramatically expands markets. I think uh, technology tends to evolve you know, very incrementally, but the cloud is not an incremental thing. It, it, it is a complete rethink, reimagination of how we do things. All right, so that comes back to this question. I have a IBM exec on here. Uh, L, um, I won't mention names. Uh, Frank, who, years ago, I said, you know, you really ought to buy service now. He just wouldn't listen to me. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we won't go there. But uh, I, <laughs> I, you know, it's just, but the elasticity is just ex extraordinary. Um, Hank, you know, in, in your world, you know, this this uh, helping companies. You know the execs transform. Have you, are you, is your talent that you're hiring different than it was five years ago? Is it kind of a hybrid business tech as opposed to business and tech? Or I mean, you know, how, yeah, no, how, how, how do you deliver these services differently? And you know, bridge that's, that's a great question, Jamie. And, and you look at EY. I mean, we hire, you know, tens of thousands of people across the world every year. Um, and it, you know, and we have some very uh, you know, and we have a wide range of businesses and, and I'd say in all of our services, um, the, uh, the skill sets are, are changing, right? It's, it's not just your, you know, your finance and accounting majors, but it, it's really getting that, um, I think we talked a lot about, do you have the right team, getting that uh, a diverse and inclusive team and, and skill sets and, and backgrounds and, and all areas and, and really getting that, inter, you know, intersection. Um, so, you know, the, the, the number of design design skills we have, engineering skills, technology skills, data skills, uh, and bringing that together is, is certainly key. I think Frank just hit it on it. You know, part of the um, the, the advantage and the opportunities of a, of a legacy firm is you know how you how you can you know build that in. Um, so that, that's definitely um, you know what we we focus on is hiring the right mix, but also um, you know we have a program we call badges, which is a a, a skill recognition of uh, training. So, you know, of our 284,000 professionals, the number of folks that are getting badges and advanced uh, artificial intelligence and data analytics and leadership, um, and that's and that's that's helping connect the whole of the firm. So, I think it's you know both, both the hiring and the training that's key to to support this uh, digital transformation. All right. Well, we'll wrap up with one last question, um, Gustavo. Um, have you figured out where that, which elevator to get on? Yeah. Well, we're building the elevator as it's moving, which is uh, not short of complexity, but certainly full of opportunity. Well, uh, we'll give everybody a little sense of the size and scale of ASAP. Then. You know, you got, we're a little over 300 people. Our business is growing consistently at over 100%. Um, so we're, we're thankfully in a, on a very healthy path. Um, but I think maybe I can answer in a much more or less ASAP specific way yeah, please do. in terms of the elevator. And I think the, the topic of AI is a particularly bastardized one in some ways. It became the new acronym of, of digital transformation where you have all sorts of people. Uh, the range of opinions range from killer robots to the void of AI capabilities being marketed as AI. So it's a, it's a big soup of, uh, of, of promises and fears and I think ultimately you can come up with some highly dystopian um, future events based on AI, or you can come up with highly utopian um, future events. And, and whether we end up with a really bad one or a really good one um, depends on what we put our minds to and, and what do we decide to build for. Um, so I, I generally, I'll keep beating the drum of making people better and making jobs more sustainable with technology because I think it'll, it'll be a, a good part, a path towards that more utopian future. Yeah, that's great. Hank, uh, uh, I'll come to you uh, and then Frank. Uh, any closing comments about the future of work or anything we didn't cover today? Yeah, no, I, I think I, my, my closing comments would be, um, you know, in this, in this area of digital transformation, um, don't, don't try to attack just one pillar. Right, 
you know, attack yeah. all three pillars, the, the, the customer experience, the supply chain experience, and the employee, because you know, unless you solve all three, um, you're not going to transform your organization. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Frank, um, we, you know, as a country, we've, you know, we've had to make a lot of rapid decisions similar to companies have had to during the, the crisis. And, you know, we brought all of our companies together on March 3rd and said, look, we're going to have a really tough situation here. We're, we're going to have to figure it out on the fly. And we had weekly board meetings with every company and, and um, you know, now 90 days in, you know, you know the, the, the business side of it is stabilized. But when you look at the national policy side, we have a number of pretty aggressive um, economic stimulus packages and whatnot. Do you think there's a role for data insights to help us make better policy decisions? Is that something that will come out of this, you know, three, five years from now when we face similar issues, uh, you know, of great uncertainty and great change that will have better real-time data? The, you know, the yeah. Fed and Treasury and yeah, I mean, uh, I think we, we, we certainly learned the hard way that not having data led to wild speculation of yeah. the COVID crisis, and it led us astray in, in many ways because, you know, we're using you know, models with, with very questionable inputs, all that kind of stuff. I think the next time this happens, if it ever happens, uh, you know, again in our, in our lifetimes, um, we're going to be much better prepared. I mean, we're learning in an absolute hurry here you yeah. know, on, on how to harness uh, data. Uh, so that's a good thing. You know, in, in general, you know, the, the world is just turning into a giant cloud here, right? Yeah. And uh, th that means that so many of our interactions, whether it's uh, a department in an enterprise, whether it's a company in its own right, whether it's a whole industry, whether it's government, they all become clouds, right? And they, and there, there are no people in the cloud, right? Because they would just fall down through it. Um, so they're, they're, they're completely electronic. And that, that means that the role of people is really in support of the cloud, you know, not being the cloud, right? And uh, that's been going on now for, you know, for, for quite a while, but it's accelerating as a, as a function of these, these shock waves that we're processing, you know. Great. Well, thank you very much. I will wrap it up. Um, uh, Gustavo and Frank, uh, thank you for your leadership roles in the innovation economy and the great companies that you're building. Uh, Hank, uh, you're a great partner to um, so many of our companies and, and, and uh, EY plays a very important role. We're excited about your new role as Vice Chair of Transformation there, bridging even more of the technology uh, innovation into uh, some of the more le legacy uh, industries. So appreciate your time today. We'll have a recording of this available. And, uh, you know, thank you again for joining us today for this important conversation.